Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. So before we start today's episode, I want to say a big thank you once again to Magic Mind for sponsoring this episode. Magic Mind is a productivity shop, but unlike other energy drinks, Magic Mind's benefits don't come from excessive amounts of stimulating compounds such as caffeine. Each shot is instead packed with natural ingredients such as nootropics and adaptogens, which are scientifically designed to improve mood and support focus, calmness, energy and productivity. And let's face it, we all need some of that in the art studio, don't we? And Magic Mind very kindly sent me some to try out. And it's kind of like a mini smoothie with a really zingy taste and it's a really great way of cutting down on the caffeine which I've been drinking way too much of. So to get your shot of magic you can go to magicmind.com forward slash kick in the creatives and get up to 56% off your subscription for the next 10 days. All you need to do is use the code KITC. Right on to today's episode. Our guest today is Megan Orman. Megan is an artist, metalsmith, teacher, writer and business coach. In addition to making and selling her jewellery, she helps artists and makers grow their businesses through her books, online classes and coaching. Now, after Megan reached out to us, I read her book, Try and See. It's all about mindset shifts to help creatives get them all done. Now, I love the book. It was a real kick up the creatives for me. And so I was curious to hear more from her. So I really hope you enjoy the show. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Um, I wonder if you could start off by telling me a little bit about yourself, a bit about your background and what you do now. Yeah, so I am, I wear a lot of hats. I am an artist, a metalsmith, a writer, a teacher, a creative business coach. I, in the course of my business, I have done a lot of different things. So I actually went to school for metalsmithing. I have a BFA in metalsmithing. It actually says that on my diploma. Um, and then I didn't know what to do with a BFA. So I went and got my MFA <laughs> and then I thought either I'm going to be a teacher, like become a full-time professor, or I'm going to start my own business. And I was lucky enough to have a, a full-time professor job for a year. And I always joke that what I learned in that year is that I didn't want to be a full-time professor. So <laughs> la- launched my own business, um, started selling my jewelry, mostly at outdoor retail craft shows and also a big learning experience because I realized I didn't want to stand in the tent, a tent in the rain every weekend. So I pivoted and started selling my jewelry wholesale. And then not long after that, I started writing a blog called Crafting an MBA, which is now called Designing an MBA, and really just focusing on um, helping other artists and makers with their businesses because I realized I can kind of geek out about the business side, but there wasn't a lot of resources for artists and makers. And so I decided I wanted to provide that. And so in the end, it came full circle and I ended up teaching as well, but teaching on my terms. You talking about standing outside in the craft fairs, I'm going to actually blame you because reading your book actually got me to book to do an art fair. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm free, well, it is, it's actually inside, but it's a really old building. So I think it's going to be cold. So that is your fault. If but I'm cold. I, I will absolutely take the blame for that. And you know, what I will say is that I don't regret doing those because I learned so much in my business. I it helped me understand who my customers were. It helped me refine my product line. Like there was so much that I learned in doing them. And so I do not for a second regret doing them. I just realized I didn't want to do them forever. Yeah, sure. I'll tell you again. And that's what actually reading your thing was why I thought reading your book was why I thought, you know, I need to try this just so I can actually get in front of people and know, know what they think. Because social media, you get a little bit of feedback, but not necessarily from the people you need feedback from if that makes sense (laughs) it totally makes sense so I know you now wholesale some of your uh, jewelry um and you like you said you juggle a lot of different career hats I'm quite quite intrigued by how you got into uh, wholesaling I don't know if you want to tell me a little bit about that yeah so that was actually 
sort of started as a fluke. So when I was doing a lot of the retail craft shows and art fairs, I was, this was back in like 2006, 2007, 2008. And I was just looking at other artists' websites and going, what shows are they doing? And I kept seeing people do this thing called the New York International Gift Fair. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but I looked and realized it was a wholesale show. And I thought, well, you know, uh, like I maybe had one or two stores reach out to me on Etsy at that point. Cause at that point I was just selling on Etsy because Shopify and things didn't really exist yet. Um, and so I thought, you know what, like maybe I'll give that a try. So I had read all these things that said you, when you apply for the show, it usually takes you like a show or two to get in. So it was November and I thought, great, I'm going to apply to the, the show. I'll go walk it in January and I'll do it in the summer. And they called me in November and said, we have a booth in the January show to feature a new jewelry artist. Would you like it? And I said, yes. And I hung up the phone and went, what did I just get myself into? <laughs> and so I, I just threw everything together. I didn't know what I didn't know. In hindsight, it was actually a good thing because I know a lot of people will go and they'll walk the show, which is really helpful, but they'll be like, oh, it's too big for me. I can't start there. I can't do that yet. And I was just like, well, I don't know anything about this. I had luckily walked some other smaller wholesale shows. So I did, I did know how they worked, but like I didn't have a line sheet. I, my booth, did, I didn't even have lights in my booth because by the time it came around to thinking about lighting, I didn't have, I was like done. I was so done. So I just showed up with my jewelry, put it out there. Um, and surprisingly had a very, very good show because I had spent that time doing the, the retail markets and refining my product line. So I had a really strong product line and buyers were like, yes, we want this. This is great. And so I did that, but I also realized this was kind of one of the things that sent me into teaching. And one of the first classes that I ever created was something called Wholesale Academy. Actually, the very first info product I created was a guide to wholesale and trade shows because I got in so many fights with my husband getting ready for that show because there was just so much I didn't know. And I was like, well, I think I have to do it this way. And he was like, why can't we do it this way? Because he was helping me build stuff. And I just thought no one should ever have to go through what I went through. And so... I was like, I started teaching and coaching and talking about wholesale because at the time there just wasn't that much information about it. And yeah, I didn't want anyone to have that stress that I had. So I'm really curious, you talk about wholesaling, is that more jewelry and products or do you think artists with visual arts can do that as well? You know, so it really sort of depends on the types of, of products that you're creating. So typically if you are a fine artist and you're doing, you know, one of a kind painting or one of a kind sculpture, you're mostly dealing with galleries who are unfortunately still on the consignment model. So they, you know, it's, it's just one of those where it's been the model for a long time, right or wrong. It's been the model. And so a lot of galleries will want to take stuff on consignment. But what I've also seen a lot of, you know, visual artists do is, you know, they'll do spinoff lines. So they'll do prints or they'll do greeting cards or they'll do things like that where stores are more likely to buy those types of things wholesale because it's a different price point. So depending on what your work looks like and your product mix, you can certainly make wholesale work um, as a visual artist. Oh, cool. Um, now you've achieved a lot of success in your career, but what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced along the way? Oh man. So, so many. So I will say I have launched a lot of different types of art and product lines that just did not work for me. So one of the the biggest things I had done the New York gift fair for two seasons with my jewelry, but I really wanted to get into home decor. So I actually, my undergrad or not my undergrad, my graduate thesis, I didn't make jewelry. I made sculpture. I made these, this big welded wire chair uh, for anyone who follows me on Instagram. Sometimes it makes an appearance in my um, Instagram posts or my Instagram stories. It's this floral pattern wire chair, completely non-functional, but I thought, oh, I, you know, I love home decor. I would love to sort of do a, a product line. So I designed this entire product line. I had this big booth at New York gift and I took it to the show and it was a flop on many levels. Like my booth design wasn't great. My pro my pricing was off. It was January of 2009. So it was the height of the recession. All, just everything about it was wrong. And I got some great press out of it. I had like amazing press, but not a lot of sales from that line. In fact, I still have a bunch of pieces from it around my studio, around my house. It's great. I love it. It's just, I use it for different things, but um, it just didn't really work out. And and over time, I've launched other product lines or other types of things where I thought, this is a really cool idea. I'm going to do this. And it didn't work. And what I realized is that, you know, as artists and as creatives, we have like an infinite amount of things that we can make, but not all of them are going to be our best fit for what we can sell. And so over time, I've let myself try different things, but they haven't all always been a success. And 
it, uh, we, you know, we've been talking about my book, Try It and See. Like, I never think anything is a failure. I always just treat it as a learning opportunity. But I've definitely put products out there into the marketplace and had them not work. And I will admit that as a creative, sometimes it's discouraging, right? When you put stuff out there and it doesn't sell. Um, but I always kind of just find my way back home and go back to the things that typically tend to work for me in my business. But then I will also say that with that struggle comes, I am, I am just as guilty of, as any other creative of shiny object syndrome, right? <laughs> like, oh, let's go do this thing. Let's go do this thing. And I think there are like, it's a challenge and it's also, an advantage, right? Because there are people who are not creative who wish they could do what we do. They wish they could come up with ideas on demand and all that stuff. So in some ways it's an asset, but then in some ways it's a challenge when you're like, oh, I feel like I've started, I like every few years, I just want to like burn my business to the ground and start something new, not because it's not working, but because I'm a creative and I get bored. So it's always sort of balancing and managing that. Yeah, totally know that feeling. Um, so what ways have you adapted your own jewelry business to make it more profitable? And obviously you still want to get the crazy element in. So how do you mix the two? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is just always making sure that I am priced appropriately. Um, anyone who has been around me for a long time knows that like raise my price, raise your prices is practically my battle cry. I talk about it in the book. Um, I just, you know, making sure that I'm priced so that I'm profitable, especially at wholesale level. So that's the, the number one thing. And then realizing that you know, not every product line is going to work well for wholesale. So sometimes I'll get in moods where I'll make something that's like really overly labor intensive or decorative. And and then I realize like, oh, that's a really hard sell at wholesale because there's just a lot of money tied up in, in the labor time. For me, typically that's where the cost comes. It's not, not material cost, it's labor. And so kind of understanding that that may or may not work. But then also giving myself permission on the creative side to play with things, to put things out on my website, to try some stuff. Um, just knowing again that not every collection is going to sell, but it's okay if I have an idea to kind of put a couple things out there or, or put things out and test them and see how it goes. So I do give myself time to sort of play and experiment in the studio because I think that's so important. And then the other thing for me that I've really come to realize is that marketing can also be a part of our creative process and it can be a creative act. And so I really let myself um, have fun and play in my product photography. So one of the things that I have started doing, I started maybe like, well, I don't even know, maybe it's been maybe like seven years. I started photographing my jewelry on myself. Um, I was always using models. I think when you make wearable stuff, it's so important to photograph on a real human. And so I was using models and I kind of got sick of waiting around for models. So I just started photographing my jewelry on myself. And I've realized that that's become a really important part of my creative process. So last year I had introduced some more kind of basic necklaces and things that I just sort of felt filled out my line. And it's definitely not the most creative work as far as like things that I'm doing in the studio, but it's, they're, they're really great, like everyday basic necklaces. But what I realized was I could have a lot of fun with my product photography. And so I started doing, I call it like portraits with plants. Cause I'm also a plant lady. And so it's just like, how can I photograph this work with like all these different kinds of plants and different outfits and things like that. And so for me, it's understanding that part of my creative expression can come through in the marketing as well as in the product. Okay. So that's how you get over the boredom factor almost. Yes. Then. Yes. <laughs> and you know, and it's funny because I realized too, that like anytime I am tired of my work, if I'm like, oh, I'm so bored with like this particular design or like, I'm kind of over this. If I put it on and start taking pictures, I'm like, oh my God, I love this collection again. <laughs> so it really is amazing how much like bringing that creative element into the photography and the marketing totally helps with the boredom factor. So when you are wholesale and you're actually making all these pieces yourself or do you get other people to help you with those? So right now I'm making everything myself. I had um, several years where I had a production assistant. Um, she worked for me 30 hours a week. She did not work out of my studio. She worked out of her own space, um, actually in a different state, which made it, you know, had its own set of challenges, but in the end it was the right decision for both of us. Um, and so I had her working for me for a while. And I, what I realized in that time, there were, there were some pros and cons to it. And you know, I'm always happy to talk with people if they're thinking about hiring and how to make that decisions. And and I, I feel like I made a lot of the right decisions when I hired her. But what I underestimated was that for me, a lot of the development of new jewelry comes when I'm in the studio doing like the sort of quote unquote boring production work, because it's when I'm doing those repetitive tasks. I'm like, oh, well, what if I also try this thing? And oh, what if I also try that thing? And so what happened was when I had someone basically making all the jewelry for me, I stopped designing jewelry. Um, and again, this was kind of that like creative, that like shiny object syndrome where I was like, Oh, let me go off and like do this thing. And let me go off and do this thing. <laughs> and, um, 
And so, but my, my stores, my buyers were like, well, where's the new jewelry? They're like, it's cool that you're making paintings right now, but like, we want new jewelry. And so I just sort of realized like it wasn't the right fit for me going forward. And so I ended up letting her go and taking that part of the production process back. Now I will also say that I do, I do less wholesale now than when I had her, right? Because part of having an employee for 30 hours a week that you have to pay for is you have to drum up 30 hours worth of a week, worth of work a week for her. And so I no longer have that. So I do a little less wholesale because I have the other sides of my business too. I have the books and I have the teaching and I have my online mentorship program. And so I do less wholesale than I used to do, but it's actually okay with me um, because the balance feels better now. Sure. And it's quite strange, isn't it? That doing those repetitive tasks is when you get creative ideas, I guess, because your brain's just not really thinking, is it? It's just drifting. Exactly. And I think too, it's sort of one of those where like, there is something nice about some days where it's like, oh. I don't feel like working, but now I can just sit down and like make some chain and like just zone out, watch some TV, like make some chain. And, and sometimes you you kind of need that in the business. It's really hard to be creative all the time. Yeah. So you live in a small town in Pennsylvania, but I read that you love the city. I um, do. So do you think it makes a difference? Is it harder for artists living in like smaller places? Like myself, I just live in, it's not a very arty little village. Um, <laughs> so do you think it makes a difference to how well you can do as an artist? You know, I think there are pros and cons. So I think about, you know, one of my really good friends, another jeweler, uh, she lives in New York City. And before that, she lived in like San Francisco and LA. So she's always lived in big cities. And you know, she is so good at meeting people and networking and she's always at events and she's always showing off her work and she's like always hustling. But the flip side is it costs her like her cost of living is like four times what my cost of living is. And so she has to make so much more money. And so it's sort of like, okay, well, it's kind of easier to hustle there, but she also has to hustle there because she has to make that kind of money. Um, and so, I will admit that like there are times we're living in a small town because my small town is also not very artsy, like where I have felt a lot of loneliness, but I also just look at it as an opportunity to how do I connect with people? Can I, you know, how do I connect with people online? I can't imagine doing this before the internet. Like I will be totally honest. I think it would have been really hard before the internet, but now it's like, oh, I can connect with friends online. I, you know, I have the friends that I've met at shows. I have people I've met at conferences. I do make it a point to like go to cities and, and travel and go places like there. I can't tell you the amount of times where I've been somewhere and someone's like, well, you live in Brooklyn, right? And I'm like, no, I absolutely do not live in Brooklyn. Um, but I'm just always like, I try to go to New York as often as I can. And I do have the advantage of being just a couple hours away from a lot of major East coast cities in the U S. So I'm, I'm really close to New York, to Philly, to Baltimore. Um, and that, that helps as well. But I think the most important thing, whether you live in a city or whether you live in a country is actually carving out time to connect with people, whether that's on Zoom, whether that's doing a podcast interview, whether that's meeting people for coffee. You know, once I do, once I did realize I had sort of like a creative kindred spirit within like an hour's drive of me, I was like, okay, we have to make it a point to meet up regularly. And then, you know, during the pandemic, we just switched to Zoom chats and now we're back to going to get coffee again. So really making it a point to do those things and even just simple little stuff. So we have finally in my tiny town, like a nice little coffee shop and they display art. And so during the pandemic, when they were just open for takeout, like I made it a point to go and like try to order and purchase from them at least once a week. Cause I was like, this is the one place in my town that shows art. I don't want it to close. Um, and so just looking for those little pockets where you live. Um, but yeah, but like, like I said, then there are the, the positive is like, It's a lot cheaper to live in the country. I have this huge studio space that I couldn't afford to have, you know, in a city. So there are definitely pros and cons. And also, I get more work done because there's less distraction. (laughs) That's that's true. Um, Now, you mentioned earlier your book, Try and See, which I have to say I really loved. And I would say it's like a kick up the bum. (laughs) That's what we'd say in England (laughs) anyway. Kick kick up the butt, I guess, for for the Americans. Um, Can you tell us about some of the mindset shifts that you suggest in the book that are really essential for accomplishing more in a creative business? Yeah. So the, the subtitle of the book is how to get shit done while overanalyzing everything. And it is, um, that's really where the book came out of is this idea that, you know, as creatives, we tend to be overthinkers. We tend to overanalyze. And rather than trying to fight that tendency, it's just how do I get stuff done, you know, in spite of it or despite of it. And so, um, really just making, making sure that you're, you're being productive. And so, Um, you know, one of the biggest things that I kind of talk about in the book is this, this idea that, you know, everything is an experiment. 
one of the things that keeps us from getting stuff done as creatives is that we want to know the outcome. And it's not just as creatives, it's as humans too. We want to know the outcome before we start, right? We want to know if the, the art fair is going to be a success. We want to know if the store is going to like our work. We want to know if this product line is going to sell. And so we try to think our way into those answers. And the reality is we have, we have no clue, right? We have no idea if anything is going to work until we do it. And so if you can switch your mindset to think of this idea of everything being an experiment, then you're like, I don't know. Let me just try it and see. And then once I've tried it, now I have data and I can go back and I can decide, oh, do I want to do more art fairs? Do I want to do this art fair again? Do I want to try some in different cities, different locations? You know, this product line didn't work the way I thought it was. Why do I think that is? Do I need to change the line? Do I need to connect with different customers? And so just being willing to putting, to put things out there and try them and remembering that nothing is a failure. Everything is a learning experience, um, which I know is, is really hard if you are a creative who also tends to be a perfectionist, which is why I also talk about, um, you know, perfectionism a lot in the book too, because that is one of those things that absolutely holds us back. And so one of my rules is like, never make anything perfect. And the idea is like, you just have to put things out there and like you leave a typo in or you, you launch before you're ready. And then you realize that the sky doesn't fall down because the people who are there kind of trying the perfectionist thing and the polishing thing, it's a really hard and stressful way to live. Um, and, and so letting go of those tendencies, I talk a lot in the book about, you know, different tricks for letting go of those tendencies, because that's, what's going to let you get more of your work out into the world. And it's only when you get more of your work out into the world that you're actually going to sell and make money and do all those things. Yeah, it was totally for me when I read that. It's, um, you get analysis paralysis, don't mm-hmm. you? And, and I totally get that. And it, it's silly that you have to have someone tell you, but I have to have you tell me <laughs> in the book, <laughs> just try it. Yeah. And, you know, and like one of the things I think that comes from analysis paralysis that I talk about in the book is this idea that we have permission to change our minds, that no decision is permanent. And I think that's why people get stuck in analysis paralysis because you think you're making a decision for the long term. And the people who don't get stuck in that, who are decisive, are the people who are like, I am making a decision in this moment and it's okay if I change my mind later. I'm going to pick this URL for my business. And if I want to change it later, it's fine. It's actually not that hard to change your website URL. I'm going to just pick MailChimp as my email provider. And you know what? If I don't like it, it's fine. I'll switch to Flowdesk later. Like people spend so much time researching those little things that don't actually make that much of a difference. Honestly, MailChimp, Flowdesk, Kajabi, whatever, they're all fine. They all, they all have their <laughs> pros and cons. They all work great. You just pick one because you can always change it later. In case anyone's listening who don't know what they are, they're, they're, they're just mailing systems, aren't yes. they? They just, yeah. Yeah, they're just mailing systems. But that's a big one. People get our, like, because email marketing is so key for a creative. And I know so many people who are like, I'm like, did you start your email list? Well, no, because I'm still trying to decide which one I want to use. It doesn't matter. Just pick one. <laughs> like, it's all fine. Um, but it, but always remembering that, like, you just make a decision because you can change your mind later. Sure. Can you share some tips or strategies for setting achievable goals and for staying on track with productive productivity and progress? Yeah. So, you know, I think the biggest thing when setting goals is it's more important to actually set actions and habits. So it's really easy to set a goal of like, I want to do whatever it is, and then not actually understand the steps to get there. And so when I think about goal setting, I always think about like, what are the tangible things that I can do? So instead of being like, I'm going to set a goal that I want to sell, you know, I want my work to be in 20 stores by the end of the year. Instead saying like, my goal is that I'm going to pitch five stores every week, whether that's sending an email or sending a postcard, whatever it is, because pitch five stores every week is something you have control over. And now it's an action that's going to bring you closer to theoretically, if you pitch five stores every week, hopefully by the end of the year, you're in 20 stores like that. That's a very doable goal. But just being like, I want to be in 20 stores, then you're like, what do I do do with that? So really thinking about, yes, this is what I want, but what are the actions and what are the habits? Um, And then building those into your business. So looking at are there tasks I'm going to do daily? Are there tasks I'm going to do weekly? Are there tasks I'm going to do monthly? And it really depends on you as a person. So some people really need like very structured daily tasks. They're like, if I don't do the same thing every day, I'm not going to do it. Other people are like what I call creative hermits, right? So you're like, I'm going to go into the studio and like in my bunker and I'm not going to 
talk to anyone for the next three weeks, but then I'm going to come out. And when I come out of my bunker, I have set aside this week where I'm going to pitch a hundred stores or I'm going to like, you know, apply to all the shows or do all the things. And so you have to kind of know your personality there. But the most important thing is that you are setting goals. And then if you're not doing the thing, then look at why you're creating resistance. I I like to say that willpower is a terrible business strategy because we actually have um, finite amounts of willpower every day. This is not my opinion. This is actual science. There have been studies about it. Like we only have so much willpower. And so if you're giving yourself actions in your business that require a lot of willpower, you're probably not going to do them over the long run. So an example that I give in the book, which also goes back to the perfectionist tendencies is, you know, a woman I work with, she was like, oh, well, when I email a pitch to a store, I spend like half an hour triple checking that I've got the person's name right. And I was like, just don't put a name in. <laughs> like, she was like, what? I can do that? I was like, yeah. If if the simple putting a name into an email stresses you out, then just take it out and just send the email without the name. It's fine. It'll still feel personal. It's all good. Um, or I have, you know, another woman that I work with who is like, she, you know, she, English is not her native language but she's in in the U S and she's like, I just don't feel comfortable writing. She's like, I get really overwhelmed with writing, but she's so good with the visuals and, and she, she's a fine artist. And so we talked about doing a lot of research to, or a lot of outreach to interior designers and art consultants. And she was like, I just can't sit and send pitch emails. It doesn't work for me. And I was like, great, then let's design a beautiful postcard mailing that you can send out. That's really all about your visuals. You don't have to sit there and try to write emails. So I think it's really important to set actions. And then if you fall through doing those actions, go back and ask yourself why, and then tweak, tweak them so that they fit more within your strengths. Oh, that's a good idea. And also, is it everybody trying chat GPT now? <laughs> hey, I guess that, that? Is de- <laughs> that is definitely a sticking po- a sore point for me. I'm like, no, just write. But here's the thing that I will say actually about the writing piece is so many artists and makers feel like they have to do so much more writing than they actually do. Like use your images to sell your work, use video. You don't even have to talk. You can just use video to show motion or show detail or show, you know, scan across a painting. You don't have to write as much as you think you do. I, most artists and makers spend too much time obsessing about their writing. 90% of your time should go into creating your visuals. 10% of your time should go into your writing. Can you share any advice or tips for artists who want to turn their creative talents into a business? Yeah. So first things first, make sure you are priced appropriately. It is very easy to ignore all of the costs that go into a business. And so what ends up happening is you end up underpricing and then you end up if things start to sell, you end up in burnout mode where it's like hamster wheel of like, I'm making the work and it's selling, but why don't I have any money? And it's because you weren't priced appropriately. So really understanding everything that goes into a business and everything that goes into pricing and making sure that you're priced appropriately so that you aren't like setting yourself up for, again, I don't, I don't like the word failure, but aren't setting yourself up for a lot of unwanted stress and burnout going forward. And then the other thing is that I understand that when you're priced appropriately at the beginning, it can feel like you're sort of expensive. And then, so then your work is a little bit slow to sell and then you feel like you are struggling. And so one, you have to stay the course because if you are vastly undercharging for your work and then you go out and try to raise your prices, you're going to realize that the audience that you originally cultivated is not the right audience anyway. So you have to stay the course, even if it feels like, oh, I'm a little high if you've done your math and you know your prices, that's where you need to be. But then the other thing that I will add that I think is so important, and this is something I talk about a lot in Artists and Profit Makers, which is my online mentorship program, is that you have to leverage other people's audiences, or as we call them in the group, OPAs. So you mentioned this at the very beginning where you were saying that um, you know you started doing art fairs because you realized like, if you sit on the internet, you're just not getting feedback or you're not getting the right feedback from the right people. And I think that's the problem is we just think, oh, well, if I just have my website and I post on social media, eventually the, these things should work, right? And it's like, no, that actually isn't how it works. The businesses that grow, grow by leveraging other people's audiences. And that could be 
doing art fairs or craft shows. That could be selling to stores. It could be getting your work featured in the press. It could be doing podcast interviews like this. Um, it could be having, you know, influencers wear your work. And when I say influencers, I want to be clear here that I'm not talking about 20 something fashionistas, though that can work if that's your audience, but literally anyone else with a bigger or different audience than you, that's an influencer. So in the early days of my business, one of my friends, was also a business coach and she would do a lot of teaching and a lot of speaking and she would wear my jewelry on stage and in classes. And she would talk about me as an example in my work. Guess what? That's an influencer. That's someone who has influence wearing my work. Was she a 20 something fashionista? Absolutely not. But she wore my work and she talked about my work and it helps me build an audience. So, you know, if you are a visual artist, that could mean partnering with interior designers or art consultants. If you are a jewelry designer or make wearable products that could literally mean giving your work to people to wear. You know, if you make ceramics, it could be, you know, giving your mugs to people who might wear them or share them in their Instagram stories, whatever it is, um, not wear them. You can't wear a mug. So I'm a, <laughs> though I'm a jewelry designer, we, jewelry designers try to wear everything. If you don't know this about us, like if it's, if it's about the size of your head, it's a hat. If you can stick your hand through it, it's a bracelet. So, um, you know, I guess you're not wearing a mug, but man, uh, jewelry designers are probably going to try. <laughs> oh dear. Can I just get back to when you were talking about pricing? Mm-hmm. Um, and I know you can't go through the entire thing about pricing. Have you got one big tip for pricing? Is it about how long it takes you or is it about looking at the market, seeing what, what the kind of general pricing is. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little bit of both of those. So here's what I will say. Um, effective pricing is going to include four elements. It's going to include your materials. It's going to include your labor. So that's how long it takes you to make something. Um, and your labor should pay you a living wage for, for where you are. So in the U.S., there's a great tool called the MIT Living Wage Calculator. Um, but if you're not in the U.S., just Google where you live and living wage, and you should get an hourly rate. Um, I recommend going above that to account for all the other time in your business that you can't get paid for. So, um, you know, like design time, marketing time, all of that. But you, at the very least, should not be below that living wage. Um, so you're, you've got your materials, you've got your, your labor, you've got your overhead, which is all the other expenses in your business, the marketing costs, the show fees, the, um, you know, your computer, your studio setup, all of that stuff that you need. That's your overhead that has to go into your price and then profit profit has to go in there as well. And that is the, that little bit of extra margin that you've got so that you're not just operating at like break even pace. Cause that's how you end up in burnout. So you've got those four elements, materials, labor, overhead, profit, those together are your wholesale price. And then you double that to get your retail price or, um, and the same thing, like even if you're a visual artist and you're selling to galleries, wholesale is basically like your, your price that you would get from a gallery. Cause they're going to mark it up. Um, you know, you would get that like 50% commission. So making sure all of that's in there, but then when you do that, that is your bare minimum price. And so you can also look around at the marketplace. And so if you set a bare minimum price and you realize, Oh, people are actually charging a lot more than that then it gives you room to go up. You can actually raise your prices um, and go up even more. But you do have to be careful about what market marketplace you're looking at. Because what happens is a lot of people, they'll go on Etsy or they'll look at like big box stores and they'll think, oh, my stuff is so high. Like I have to be lower. No, you can't go to those artificially low marketplaces. And yes, Etsy is artificially low. Um, you have to look at places where people are spending more money. You know, look at high-end retail, look at high-end art art galleries, look at high end shops, you know, high street, all those things, like look at all of that stuff and see what the potential is. I always tell people go out and try to find the most expensive thing in your product category and just see what that is. Um, but it starts with knowing your numbers and then looking at the marketplace from there. Great. Um, in your bio, you say you've got a really unique perspective on social media and I'm, mm. I'm quite curious about this, know more about this, um, that you were an early adopter of Instagram, but now you question it. Can you tell me more? Yeah. So when I first discovered Instagram and Instagram and Pinterest, I really had like a very similar, similar reaction to both, which I was like, yes, finally a visual platform. You know, this goes back to the whole, like, it's trying not to spend all our time writing for stuff, you know, before that I was on Twitter and I was like, everything was just about text. And I was like, no, as visual artists, we're used to presenting our work visually. And I thought, great, like these are platforms that finally, finally understand us. And so I was on Instagram really early and I I've met a lot of great people through Instagram and I still use Instagram. Um, but the flip side is one, we know that there's a lot of, um, you know, unhealthy 
stuff that happens on Instagram where it really can have an impact on our mental health and our sense of self and all of these things. So there is that challenge too. It's just a freaking time suck, right? <laughs> so like it's amazing. You go on Instagram for like three seconds and then suddenly two hours later, you've you've lost two hours. Yeah, and, yeah. um, and so there's that, that problem. And then, you know, now the challenge is like, as, as artists and makers, as small business owners, it's really hard for our work to get seen there. But I think for me, the, my biggest issue with it is that in terms of marketing, it sucked all the air out of the room. So what happened was everyone was like, Oh, here's this platform where I can connect with my customers. And they stopped doing any other marketing tasks. It's like, Oh, well I post on Instagram and I'm done. So what, like, why isn't my business growing? It's like, cause Instagram alone, and you could apply this to any social media platform. Instagram alone is not a marketing strategy. It is like a tiny, 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 tiny piece of the puzzle. And so if you're serious about growing your business, you have to do all of this other stuff too, but it's so easy to get sucked into focusing all of your time and energy on Instagram instead of doing the other work. And so that's actually my biggest issue with it is that we are overly reliant on it, even though the return on investment of our time is is so, for the most part, not worth it. What would you suggest instead? Or is that just a too massive question to ask you? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, okay, we'll try to do it really quick. So number one, ha- have your own website. Number two, and maybe even imp- more important than number one, have an email list and encourage people to join your email list and then actually email them regularly. So because at the end of the day, the email list is the audience you own. You don't own Instagram followers. You don't own TikTok followers. You don't own Facebook followers. Like you, you don't own any of those. And I've seen people who've literally had their entire Instagram and Facebook shut down for infractions that they didn't even do because you know someone tried to hack them. So make sure you've got an email list so that you've got a way. And then if you are posting to Instagram or any other social platform, consistently remind people to join your email list. Put that sign up in, in your bio. Make sure it's really clear. Put that sign up link everywhere on your website, right? Get people on your email list. Um, so that, you know, that is really important. If you can. I also recommend taking whatever images, whatever content you're putting on Instagram and putting it somewhere else too. So like I put images on my blog. I also pin them to Pinterest. You know, if you are someone who's doing a lot of video, you might also choose to put that on YouTube, making sure that your content lives in other places besides Instagram. I always say if the only place you share an image is Instagram, you've wasted that image, put it other places as well. Um, and then the last thing, which is the biggest marketing thing, especially in the beginning, is what we were just talking about, those OPAs, those other people's audiences. Don't just post on Instagram and hope someone's going to find you. Figure out what feels best for you. Is it doing retail shows? Is it selling to stores or having your work carried by galleries? Is it pitching the press? Is it working with influencers? And it might be some combination of all of those things, especially in the beginning, because you don't know. But doing those things and being proactive and not just waiting for like, the Instagram algorithm gods to bless you because chances are like you'll win the lottery first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely know what you mean by that. Um, now, many artists, including myself, uh, struggle with self-doubt and that imposter syndrome. Now, I don't know if you still get this, <laughs> but if you do, what advice would you give to other artists? Yeah, so funny story about that. I have two degrees in metalsmithing And it took me such a long time to call myself a metalsmith because it was a combination of when I was an undergrad, the joke was I was the metalsmithing major who never worked in metal. I was like hanging out in the fiber studio. I was doing all this alternative materials stuff, like making things out of balloons and, and whatever, like all of this other stuff. And then when I got to grad school, I did eventually switch and started working more in metal, particularly in steel. But I went to grad school with two of like the most technically skilled metalsmiths I have ever met in my life. And it absolutely made me feel inferior. And so coming out of school, I was like, I can't call myself a metalsmith. Like they're real metalsmiths. I'm not a real metalsmith. I have two freaking degrees in it and I couldn't do it. So like, don't like imposter syndrome impacts everyone. It just understand that it, it absolutely happens. Um, but what I realized was like, Hey, within any field, everyone has different strengths. So like my strengths were really in like designing amazing, repeatable production jewelry, which is actually a really hard skill. That's why I teach a class in it. Like it's actually a really hard skill. Um, and so I had that skill, but I also realized that like, there's no, there's no right or wrong path. So I think a lot of imposter syndrome comes from thinking that we don't have 
the right background, right? Like, oh, well, they're more technical than me, or I didn't go to school for this, or like, who am I to think that, that I'm worth this? But there really is like no, no right path. Everyone comes to things differently. And so you are allowed to own whatever it is. And then I also think about like how quickly other people will confer things on us that we won't confer on ourselves. So I recently started baking. Like I just got super into baking and because I am like an all or nothing personality instead of being like, I don't know, I'm going to make some cookies or some cakes. I was like, I'm going to learn how to make the best croissant ever. (laughs) And so I've been making croissants. I've only been baking for like the last couple of months. And it's amazing how many people on Instagram, and this is just me occasionally posting like a picture of the croissants I've made in my stories. How many people are like sending me memes about croissants or sending me (laughs) posts and being like, I thought of you. And the same thing happened when I started getting into house plants a few years ago. It was like, oh, suddenly Megan's a plant lady. Everyone else around us is so much more quick to like give us these titles that we won't take on ourselves. And so I think it can be helpful to like look at us ourselves from other people's eyes, right? How do other, how would other people see us? And chances are other people are going to say, you are a metalsmith. You are a plant lady. You are a croissant obsessed person. I don't even, I don't know what the adjective is for that, but like, and so, you know, stop thinking and worrying about what the gatekeepers and industries put in, because honestly, gatekeepers suck, right? Like gatekeeping is designed to keep everybody out. That's not like a straight white man. So ignore the gatekeepers and think about like how the people who love us view us. And those people are going to be like, yes, you're an artist. Of course you're an artist. Of course you're a metalsmith. Of course you're a plant lady. Those are the titles that those people are going to give us. And so we should we should embrace those for ourselves. So can you tell me a bit about your book, which I loved, like I said before, and also your coaching programs? Yeah. So my book is called Try It and See. Like I said, how to get shit done while overanalyzing everything. Um, it is, it's actually like a quick little book. It is available in paperback, in ebook, in audiobook. Uh, you can get it in my online store at shop.meganalman.com. For people who want the paperback but are not in the US, you can also buy it off of a certain big <laughs> online retailer. I understand international (laughs) shipping sucks. Um, so I will not begrudge anyone who wants to buy it from there to avoid international shipping. But if you want the audio version that is only available in my online store, so you can go there to get the audio version. If you'd like to listen to me, read it to you in the studio, uh, because that I know is very important. So I thought I also have since, um, launched two other books. So one is the artists and profit makers guide to selling to stores. So if you want to know more about wholesale, you can grab that. And then I just did a book, Um, called Making Money, Mindset, and Marketing, The Best of Designing an MBA, which is kind of like my best blog posts from 13 years of running my blog now. Um, So those are all available in my online store at shop.meganalman.com. And then on top of that, I run an online coaching program called Artists and Profit Makers, which is at artistsandprofitmakers.com. And that is really um, group coaching. We have an online forum. It is not a Facebook group. I hate, cannot stand Facebook groups. It is our own <laughs> private forum that's just focused on going in there. People can ask questions, get feedback. I'll literally do like video reviews on people's line sheets, on their websites, on all kinds of aspects. And then we also do a monthly training and a monthly Q&A. So I really wanted a place that was just for artists and makers where, you know, I could focus, I could give a lot of attention, I could help cut through sort of like all that crap advice that doesn't apply to us. Um, and so, and it's a really wonderful supportive community. It's been going, started in 2018. So it's been going strong for, we're, we're just about to our five year anniversary. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can work with me there as well. Just shows how productive you are. Two more books you've written as well. <laughs> yes, I really, um, I have no chill. So actually, that's <laughs> not true. I do try to relax a lot. But um, yeah, I, I put out a couple more because I just, I don't know, I got really excited about books. I mean, I love books. <laughs> I've, I've always loved books. So that was kind of one of those big things for me. Um, but yeah, you can find those all on my website. And your website is? So you can go to MeganAmond.com or you can go directly to the shop at shop.meganamon.com and you'll find links to pretty much everything I do there. And so what are your plans for the future? I'm guessing more books. Yes. yes. So (laughs) more books for sure. Um, I have like a whole list of ideas of things that I'm working on. Um, you know, potentially more online classes too. I love, I love writing online classes, um, more jewelry, more plants, more croissants, just a little (laughs) bit more of everything. So where can people find out more about you? Uh, on your website, I assume, is the main place. Yes. So if you go, if you get, if you go to MeganAmond.com, you can learn more about me, um, find all of my stuff, my jewelry, my books, my classes, um, pretty much everything I have to offer 
I've linked from there. You can also uh, scope my about page and and somewhere in there is a link to that wire chair I was talking about. You can get a little sneak peek of that. <laughs> um, you can also find me on Instagram as much as I begrudgingly um, have my moments. I do. I am still there. I, I do actively use it. So you can go um, look me up. I'm Megan Almond on Instagram as well. Um, I'm also Megan Almond on Pinterest. I like to hang out there as well, especially when I get sick of Instagram. <laughs> I go that, hang on on Pinterest for a little bit. Is that just uh, cro- croissants though on there? No, actually, it's mostly plants. I'll be totally honest. It's mostly plants. My my croissant board is um that one's private for some reason right now. I have like one food board, but no, it's a lot of plants at this moment and a lot of like pictures of people with plants because I'm real into that. Um, but so yeah, so you'll find that there. I'm very active with that uh, for the business as well. And then um, if you want to read more of my blog posts specifically related to business, you can go to designingandmba.com. Do you know, it's really funny. I was uh, Googling the other day because I was thinking, how can I make a panel for when I do this art show? I'm, a- I'm actually not going to do it now. But I so saw I search it. Who comes up? You. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is. There is a video that I did about that. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought, how weird. But that is thank- super funny. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I've learned loads, so I'm hoping everybody else will. I'm sure they will. But yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so much fun. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes.